Well, I'll start by thanking everybody. It's good to see new faces and familiar faces on behalf of the support staff assembly steering committee. I wanna welcome Peggy Landwehr Roski today. She is the archivist and Peggy grew up in St. Cloud and was the last to graduate from St. Ben's High School before it closed. She and her husband, Michael, who is now retired, retired from Abbey Woodworking, graduated from St. Ben's and St. John's in 1977. After a couple of years of travel and other jobs, Peggy started working at the Alcuin Library in the support staff in 1979. After a couple more years and a wedding, she got her master's degree in library science and was one of the reference and instruction librarians here for 25 years before becoming the full-time archivist for St. Ben's and St. John's in 2006. Like the Benedictines, her family's roots run deep in Stearns County and stretch back to Bavaria. The Roskies families I'm sorry, the Roski family's youngest members are a granddaughter who will be 15 months old tomorrow, a three-year-old grandson named Felix Michael Roski with a sibling for Felix on the way. Peggy enjoys sharing the history of St. Ben's and St. John's and gives history lessons to all the administrative assembly luncheons. So with that, I'd like to welcome Peggy. Thank you, Michael. Um, I have, well, I started with something like 300 slides. <laughs> and I knew that was gonna be way too much, so I cut it down. There's still over a hundred. So I'm gonna go real fast and talk real fast and trust that if you see something that you wanna know about more about, you'll ask me later, or I'll give you some hints on where to look. But, oh, there's just so many interesting things to say. It was really hard to decide what to, what to cover and, and what to leave out. So I think you need to have me come back again <laughs> another time for all the, all the stuff that I left out. Um, for starters, there's four different archives on the campuses. And as Michael said, I, I managed two of them, the one for the College of St. Benedict and the one for St. John's University. And then the Abbey and the Monastery at St. Ben's each have their own archive as well. The websites are similar and they're loaded with stuff, useful resources. Um, including several books like Worship and Work about St. John's and With Lamps Burning, which is about St. Ben's. You can use the A to Z index to get to the websites. And there's lots of other interesting things as well. To name a few um, buildings, if you want to know anything about the building that you work in or any of the other buildings on campus, I've got a web page for almost every building on campus that gives its history and pictures and historical pictures and a bibliography of things to link to for more. Um, there's lots of things on the timeline that uh, Miranda Novak, um, programmer extraordinaire in IT services created for me way back when because I just needed a place like that to put all the important dates and make them easier for me to find. So now they're easy for other people to find too. Um, photos and maps. I love maps. I love aerial photos and other photos. So there's a collection of them available on the website. And last but not least, there's links to all my history lessons and there are over a hundred of them now. <laughs> I put a search box at the top because I couldn't find things myself. It's like, okay, I did one about the bridges. What did I call it? Oh, put in the word bridges. Oh, it's Lake Sagatagan's bridges. <laughs> so um, look for those. Okay, to start at the beginning, 176 years ago, the monks left Germany. And then 166 years ago, they were in St. Cloud. They were the stopover in Pennsylvania first at St. Vincent's. 156 years ago is when they moved up here to the campus we are in, on now. In between those last two, they went back and forth to St. Joe a couple of times, and they moved to Indian Bush near Collegeville here, which was the first place around here that they landed. Here's a drawing of their first home in Minnesota on the banks of the Mississippi in St. Cloud. There's a historical marker near the spot on the Beaver Island Trail near St. Cloud State. You might have seen it. Abbey chronicler Alexius Hoffman um, later wrote that the group of five original buildings were totally destroyed by an early morning fire in 1886. 
it was inhabited at that time by an organ builder. And I like to think that Abbey Woodworking's upcoming establishment of an organ building shop will not involve defective chimneys. The St. John's Benedictines moved to Collegeville area, to the Collegeville area in a place called Indian Bush, the precise location of which wasn't consistently uh, documented, even by Alexius Hoffman. He gave three, four, or five different possible locations for it. In January of 1883, the old buildings at Indian Bush burned down, the next of several major fires affecting St. John's over its history, which is a good reason why they have their own fire department. <laughs> they need it. Um, it was noted that, <laughs> quote, this was no appreciable loss, yet it was regrettable that the vener venerable landmark disappeared, leaving not a trace. Okay, to my knowledge, this 1874 state atlas is the earliest to show St. John's on the map. The 1896 plat maps show greater detail, this is 20 some years later, including properties platted for the town of Collegeville. There's a close up. So um, this image is from that same atlas from its section on towns and cities. It shows platted lots with named streets and the post office is in the south corner of block three, that little black dot in the middle there. One of the coolest things to come along when the internet became uh, available to us all was the ability to find maps. And I found this map on Google Maps of Collegeville in 2006, 110 years after the 1896 map. And some of those platted street names, Alexia Street, Ulrich Avenue, St. John Street, St. Benedict Street still showed up <laughs> as if they existed in 2006. <laughs> and that uh, actually continued for several years before they, they got smart and changed it. Um, and MapQuest as well as Google Maps had that same um, goof, if you will. Here's a cool 1938 aerial view um, that we have in the archives showing the Collegeville vicinity and it's fuzzy zooming in this much, but you can see mostly the broker farm buildings by the railroad tracks, which are now the Wittrock farm buildings by the Wobegon Trail. Wittrock's um, descended from the brokers, or Wittrock's married into the broker family, I should say. So train service on those railroad tracks began in 1872, in which the historical plaque down by the Wobegon Trail documents and a Collegeville stop was added in 1879. So here are some early images of the train station and post office, which was relocated to the south side of the tracks um, in 1900 when the Great Northern Railroad come, just, uh, picked up the first uh, railroad station and moved it to Ronneby. <laughs> they needed a building in Ronneby, so they just took it away. Um, so um, the monks built a new one on the other side of the tracks. And here's a photo of that building from a few years ago. Remember the quote I said earlier about the venerable Indian Bush landmark disappeared, leaving not a trace? Um, actually, it did leave a trace. Old handcrafted nails, some of which are now in the SJU archives, were dug up generations later and proved where the first Collegeville buildings had been. Alexius Hoffman tied Indian Bush's location to the Collegeville station but he contradicted himself several times about the specifics. I finally found a footnote that gave some really specific dimensions and um, got a GIS student to map the coordinates. And I talked to a lot of people, including the Hansons and the Cofell neighbors. Um, it turned out that they had been finding these old nails in their garden on St. John's land behind the Hanson house you know, for years, giving proof of Indian Bush's location. You can follow that whole story in one of my history lessons. Where was Indian Bush? It's under the W's. <laughs> the nails ha may have come from this log building, which, had, which burned down, as I mentioned, or from the frame house. For the first time, and certainly not the last time, the monks moved a building. The frame house was taken apart and reassembled overlooking Lake Sagatagan. Uh, when they figured out that this, this was a much more pleasant place to establish an abbey up here by Lake Sagatagan. The transplanted frame house, the chapel, 
it, it contained a chapel, brother's quarters, three private rooms, and a carpenter and tailor shops. And next to it, they built the stone house. In this 1881 photo, you can see the frame house and the stone house. By now, a lot of the quad, including the church, now the Great Hall, had also been built, though the west end of the quad had yet to be added. Here's what those buildings look like from the west and from the east. Another view of the east facade of St. John's in 1883 shows the six earliest buildings, including the first Abbey Church, aka the Great Hall with the two oldest, the frame house and the old stone house on the left. And here's a close up of those two. These two buildings no longer exist. So a rear view of St. John's from the Southwest, once the quad had been completed, shows the frame house Southwest of the stone house. But by the time this, this uh, 1887 photo was taken, the frame house is no longer there. It had been torn down by that point. <clears throat> So the building next to it is now the oldest building on campus, though it had some trying times, including being per partially obliterated by the 1894 tornado. When it was rebuilt, it was given another two stories so that it lined up with the four, flaws, four floors of the quad next to it. So you know it as the retirement center building and the sloggy is in the renovated first floor and so on. Did you know that St. John's was initially called the college? It, and that it was located on Lake St. Louis initially. That's because King Ludwig I of Bavaria financed Boniface Wimmer and St. John's. You may have heard of Ludwig's castle in Bavaria built by crazy King Ludwig. It's also known as the prototype for Cinderella's castle by the Disney folks. But St. John's King Ludwig wasn't the crazy one who built it. That was his nephew, King Ludwig II. So today's presentation is about curiosities. Um, it, it's kind of a catch-all title, but Indian Bush's location was something I was curious about from the start. Um, and something else I was curio curious about shortly after I started in the archives was this map of Lake Sagatagan. It's hand-drawn, it's undated, it's not attributed to anybody, and it showed names for things around the lake that I had never heard of before. So since most everyone walks along the lake to the chapel, I thought I'd share these curiosities with you today. Here's a close up. I'll be switching back and forth somewhat between this map and the Google Maps view, because our aerial photos fascinate me. First, starting near the campus, the old laundry. The first laundry stood by the lake from 1878 to 1913. Now only the drying house is what remains. Here's a 1932 aerial photo showing the drying house and the extent of the drought in the 1930s Dust Bowl years. Look how far it is to the shore of the lake compared to where the water starts today, or compared to this more recent photo showing the old drying laundry drying house, now the storage building down by the beach. So if you don't start, start your walk to the chapel by the beach trailhead, you can also get there by taking this shortcut using the walkway that goes right past the prep school or even going all the way around down to the prep school dorm. But if you do that, you'll miss all the interesting sites on Pickerel Point, which is the name for the SJP Peninsula that juts out into Lake Sagatagan. Alexis Hoffman didn't know for sure why it was called Pickerel Point, but he speculated that it was because of some good fishing off of that point. If you take the long way, the first point of interest you if you take the long way, the first point of interest you come to is right about here. You come to the statue of St. Kateri Tekakwitha. That spot actually used to feature a crucifix overlooking the lake. It was carved by Father Cornelius Whitman, who was one of the pioneer monks um, for the Indian mission up at White Earth. In 1930, it was brought down here. And it had a wooden roof like the wayside crosses in his Bavarian homeland. The need to preserve it was recognized and it was brought inside to the monastery to a place of honor outside the abbot's office. With the renovations they did recently in the uh, Breuer wing of the monastery, it's now located inside the Breuer building out of the public view, at least according to my informant. 
I'm pretty weird. The Cannery Tekakwitha statue originally graced the St. Olaf Church in downtown Minneapolis, of which I don't have a picture, but it was gifted to St. John's in the 1950s. So this early photo shows that, you know, there's, she's got a good view of the lake. There aren't so many trees around yet. The hill where she stands was dubbed Adrianople in honor of Father Adrian Schmidt, who planted many of the trees there. The Cannery Tekakwitha, oh, excuse me, um, the first trees were planted in 1894, the year of the tornado. Adrian's father and his brother were government foresters back in the Schwarzwald, the Black Forest in Germany. And as the story goes, Father Adrian sent soil samples to Germany, and then his relatives sent back seeds and instructions, or seedlings and instructions. Moving on past Tekakwitha and Adrianople, we come to Caesars Bay, which is where the prep school athletic fields are now. It was said to be a good place to go fishing. And by other accounts, it was a shallow swampy area. It gradually filled in and then the athletic fields were created when the earth removed for the building of the prep school and the dorm was deposited there to fill it in. I guess they didn't have wetlands protection laws back then like we have nowadays. Next up on the map is the bridge of size, quote unquote. It's a name from Venice where it denotes a bridge that convicts crossed on their way to prison. This bridge has had several manifestations, one of which is shown in this early photo. I did a whole history lesson on bridges back in 2014. It went from being a rather rickety looking bridge to concrete. And here's an undated photo showing a couple of students on it around the same time. It was eventually enhanced and perhaps made safer, although in most years there wasn't much water running under it. The covered bridge there now replaced the old concrete bridge in 2016. Bandhouse Park featured this bandstand, which Alexius Hoffman says was moved to Pickerel Point in 1892 and where the band played once or twice. The left photo is from 1909. Alexia says that gradually the timber was carried off and burned and no trace remains. Our next feature is familiar to fairly recent chapel hikers and I'm guessing those of you who have been here for a few years have witnessed at least one of its transformations. This photo dates to 2011. For many years, this trailside shrine stood empty and neglected, a rather sad reflection on the community's devotion. Um, as it was devoid of any deity, saint, or signage. I had heard rumors of an attempt to renovate it, and something seemed to be underway when I found it looking like this in April 2019. And indeed, by the fall of 2019, a beautiful new shrine had been put in place, an image of the Annunciation created by Dietrich Spahn, who's the same artist who did the stained glass window in the chapel renovation in 2007. But there's something very interesting about this shrine, something about which most people seeing it are totally unaware. Um, and it's kind of interesting and fascinating, historically speaking. When I was first investigating its history years ago, I found this photo of it in an Abbey publication with a statue of Our Lady of the Lake as she appeared before re being replaced by St. Francis. The article was in the Abbey Quarterly, which is the predecessor to the Abbey Banner. And it was an accounting of a conversation between Father Alfred Deutsch, one of my favorite professors, um, and, who was the Quarterly's editor, and uh, Father Angelo Zonkel, who some of you may remember as the oldest monk of St. John's, the one who survived the longest, although he's got some competition now from Father Killian and um, somebody else is getting, yeah, getting up there. Um, so um, he said, uh, uh, um, Angelo said that this shrine, which then had a tiny statue of St. Francis in it, originally sheltered Our Lady of the Lake. So after a li little digging, I located this photo showing the shrine in its St. Francis phase. Uh, but here's where things get really interesting. Going back to Angelo's story, he said, if you look carefully at the concrete slab on which the shrine rests, you will see a line cut into the concrete, which the local astronomer had cut to aid in adjusting the transit instrument. Father Alfred adds that another monk remembered that when he was a student, the trees and the brush had been kept clear so that one could still see 
the line and the shrine from the observatory tower up on the hill. Father Angelo said that the shrine was most likely an afterthought to the building of a pier for the Meridian Line. Imagine that. First they put up the Meridian Line, and then they thought, well, we might as well make a shrine out of it. In an earlier history lesson about the observatory building, um, I explained that it sat atop of the hill where the prep school is now, and it was torn down when the prep school was built. As this photo looking north from the shrine shows, the trees have grown to obscure the view of the observatory from that's on top of the hill, and even the prep school academic building is now out of sight. But the shrine would have been due south of the observatory. An article in the 1938 record confirmed what Father Angelo said, that the shrine to Our Lady of the Lake was built directly in line with the observatory, and the line in its base marks the 46th degree of latitude. However, Geocacher extraordinaire and archives assistant Liz Knuth <laughs> later re related that the 46th latitude is in fact an east-west line between Avon and Collegeville townships, um, north, and it runs just north of the academic fields here. So this matter bears further investigation. <laughs> Meridian Park and the shrine didn't make our map, but that's maybe the map dates from a time when the shrine was empty and the map drawer figured it wasn't worth noting. Here's one more image from the 1923 yearbook with the meridian line faint but visible. The article containing Father Angelo's memories was called Touring the Short Beat. This is something I'm still very curious about. Um, and it's still a mystery to me, the actual route of the beat. Thanks to many generations of hikers, the part of the route that went to the chapel is even more evident today than it would have been in Father Angelo's heyday but the beat apparently formed a circumference around the campus and it was a boundary for students. So if they went past the beat boundary, the path that was the beat, they could get expelled. <laughs> but I've never found a map or a description of where the beat path went on the north side of campus or the east side, just I know it included going to the chapel. So that's still one of my mysteries. Moving on, the arm of Lake Sagatag to the east is named Boniface Bay after founder Boniface Wimmer. And Alexius Hoffman mentions the two bridges that were built in 1915 or so, with the bridge of size being the one on the west side of Pickerel Point and Caesars Bay. And on our map, the other one is labeled Pete's Bridge. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> it must be the stone bridge on the east side of Pickle Point built in 1917 and pictured here high and dry, which is more, it's more typical state nowadays. And here's a few larger um, views of those photos. <clears throat> um, the east one was apparently necessitated when a canal was dug in the late 1890s between Caesars Bay and Boniface Bay to keep the Boniface uh, the Caesars Bay from becoming a swamp, which it was starting to be anyway. But why Peach Bridge? I did a lot of searching into possible namesakes, Pete, Peter, yeah, St. Peter. But uh, when I came across this passage in the 1917 record, it looks like Pete's Bridge is a typo and the correct name is the Prefix Bridge. And that made more sense, especially since I failed to find a Pete after which it could have been named. So continuing on our way, here's another mystery, Altos Park. I've never turned up any reference to Altos Park, but there is a possible namesake for it in the person of Father Alto Walter, who was, uh, died in 1931. So his scriptorium biography showed that he was heavy set and rather awkward, but not in the least bothered by the good humored remarks made at his expense. And then it follows with a story about his nickname, which is given to him by a delirious woman in Collegeville to whom he was ministering the sacraments. So in reply to his asking her, kennst du mich? In other words, do you know me? She replied, Saulkoff beast. You are a pig's head. <laughs> the fellow monks at first didn't let him forget it. <laughs> and then when they seemed to, he brought it back up because he was feeling neglected. <laughs> so on our walk, now we come to another puzzle, something near the prep dorm and uh, the subject of another history lesson. I called it the mystery on the forest floor. 
Um, it's uh, as the other history lessons, you can find it from the archives website or in digital commons. So on our walk, we now come to, we come to this puzzle and just off the trail, you may very likely walk right nearby and not even notice it. The photo on the left indicates the scale of its size. What does it relate to? Well, if you walk a little farther east to the east side of the prep dorm, St. Michael Hall, you get a clue because a similar sculpture is mounted on its outside wall. Here's a close up. Here's a side by side comparison. Do you notice what's different? Yeah. The students on the forest floor are facing to the left and the, those on the dorm are facing to the right. So it turns out that the one discarded on the forest floor was most likely a trial run that may have been rejected because the casters accidentally got it backwards or maybe it really was just a practice run. And there was yet another mystery on the forest floor when Liz and I came to call the mystery steps. And it's a puzzle that took several years to solve. We kept our eye out on this one for a long time. It was brought to my attention years ago by one of Lance and Ideen's archeology span students at Prep. And I'm guessing most of you wouldn't even notice if, it, if this was your view while walking down the trail as when I took this photo in 2019. But a closer look shows some things worth investigating, especially to an archeology span student or an archivist. If you zoom in on the left, side of the photo, you see what looks like some steps in the little hill. And here's what you see on the right, some more steps. And in the middle, you see this, not exactly features of mother nature. The stairs are even more noticeable in this 2012 photo taken by the archeology span student who came to the archives hoping I could tell him the story. Um, and thus began a years long hunt by yours truly and Liz to find out what it was about these steps that we call the mystery steps. So the late Andrew Goltz, brother Andrew, told me he thought he recalled um, a chapel walk wayside shrine where um, processions to the chapel could stop for a prayer. Going back to Father Angelo, he went on to mention the remains of a second shrine, which he believed to have been built by the class of 1913, and of which nothing was left but a concrete block that had once held a plaque, kind of like this one maybe. And the other clues fit. The concrete block from the plaque was from a second shrine after the stone bridge before he took the trail to the left toward the prep dorm. Unfortunately, the class of 1913 clue didn't lead anywhere and he didn't mention steps. But then in June, 2020, a box of materials from the Abbey archives was being processed and Liz found this postcard photo, yay Liz, labeled 1918 on the back. And we both kind of went, Eureka, <laughs> proof. Note that the brick steps, seven of them, and the lake in the distance and the small plaque on the right and the kneeler above it and what could be a shrine in front of it, though it's kind of hard to make out with the features, but the, the, it, things fit. So there's no doubt in our minds that this 1918 photo depicts the original site, which now features crumbling steps and a plaque base that are still visible more than 100 years later. The 1918 photo date clue led me to this tidbit in the June 1918 record, which said that the college sophomores had constructed a shrine near Boniface Bay with a shrine dedicated to Our Lady of Perpetual Help. Sophomore year was then the end of the line for most students in those days. St. John's offered four-year bachelor's degrees, but few actually earned them. Most students stayed for two years. So the sophomore class would indeed have been co considered the class of 1918, not the class of 1913. So Father Angelo was just off by a few years, or maybe somebody wrote the number wrong. It <laughs> didn't make it an eight instead of a three. So the names for features on the east side of the lake are pretty self-evident. We've got a slough, we've got a stony bar, stony point, sandy point, and that brings us to the chapel. The 150th anniversary of the dedication of the first chapel was observed last summer. It, was, uh, it burned down and was replaced by the present one in 1915, and it's undergone several major renovations over the decades. Alexius Hoffman brought sentimental attention to the first chapel's loss in this Song of Hiawatha-like epic poem he published in the record in 1906. 
Over me the sun shone brightly, and beside me stood a wigwam, all of red stone, strangely builded, and its whitened top did upward to the sky's point like a finger. So I suspect this poem, spiritual and pastoral, and also culturally appropriating, since it's written from the point of view of an indigenous person, um, may have had something to do with motivating the students and monks to build the new chapel. The stone buttresses and bricks are still visible in the 2001 photo on the left. The 20, 2007 renovation included stucco, buttress removal, and a blue door, and a very nice stained glass window for that matter. So there's no path along the lake beyond the chapel, but our map continues showing channels to Lake Ignatius, because if you were in a boat, you could try entering Lake Ignatius in two places. Um, I haven't puzzled out the name for the namesake for this lake. It's St. Ignatius. There's two monks that had the name Ignatius, but one was here too early and the other one was here too late. So I'm not sure where the Ignatius name comes from. Ulrich's Island up next was probably named for Father Ulrich Northman, who taught music, English, religion, and history. And he could play any music at first sight, supposedly. And although he looks rather forbidding in these photos, he reportedly had an easygoing, jovial, carefree attitude, which endeared him to students. It says that his friend, Abbot Alexius, made him the butt of many of his jokes. The derivation of the horseshoe Ben's name is obvious, but a story goes along with it that has to do with the south side of the lake. Bear with me here on your navigation skills. It's one of the few stories concerning the indigenous people's presence here on campus. An aged Ojibwe related the story of a battle between the Ojibwe and the Sioux having taken place with the combat combatants camped on opposite shores of the lake. But we need to reorient the compass to match the map because it's got it the other way around. So I moved, flipped it upside down. So you got the Sioux on the west side and the Ojibwe on the right side as we look at this map. Moving on to the west side of the lake, we find two features named after the Myers. A Mr. Meyer and family lived in a log house there. His wife used to do laundering for St. John's. His son, Sebastian, settled in Avon Township and is one of the pillars of the Collegeville Parish. So Sebastian Meyer took off for Avon Township, which you know, is right here. Um, I'm not positive of a direct relationship. I didn't have time to look this up, but I suspect Rolf Meyer may have been Sebastian's son. Rolf and his wife, Clara, also pillars of the Collegeville Parish, established Meyer's Fruit Farm, the namesake for Flinttown's Fruit Farm Road and the precursor to today's Collegeville Orchards. So it used to be Meyer's Farm. Then there are some occasional islands, depending on the depth of the lake at a given time, that were dubbed the British Isles and a Lily Bay, and then you get to Rupp's Point and Ruppville. I've asked Fred Rupp of Cathedral High School, Les Voyageurs fame, some of you are acquainted with him or know of him, and uh, Catherine Rupp, who's working here in the Benedictine Institute and a couple other places, and they're not apparently related to Collegeville's Mr. Rupp. But the Rupp star was in the general vicinity of the house in this photo, but Rupp's house was built a little bit later, so that's not it. It's just in about the same place. Mr. and Mrs. Rupp ran a little store there and a popcorn cart, and he also provided transportation for St. John's with the vehicles that he owned. He's mentioned in the record now and then. From this quote, it would appear that the store was a favorite of the students. What sounds like beer, looks like beer, tastes like beer, but isn't beer, Mr. Rupp's solution. <laughs> Who knows what that was, but it sounds like beer, tastes like beer. Um, and there's another story about him actually catching some students who would sneak off at night with his boat and go fishing on the sag at night in, in the dark. And he wanted to catch him. So he tied a string to the boat and ran it through his house all the way up to his bedroom. And then when they started to make off with the boat that night, something fell to alert him. And so he ran out and caught the students who were, who were trying to rent his boat for free. <laughs> then there's the cemetery for both monks and local people. It was moved there from the first spot near the quad about where the bell banner is today. I have a history lesson about that one too. 
Hoffman mentions the handsome cement wall that fronts it. It had wrought iron and pillars and angels. And across the road from the cemetery entrance was Abbott's Landing, a grandiose structure that featured stately lions posed with St. John's banners. Um, there's a story about the lions too, but that'll have to be for another day. One of them is exhibited in the prep school. Last, the Lourdes Grotto is private to the monks, but some of you may have seen it. For details, look for the St. John statues history lesson. And here is that aerial view that I showed you earlier in reference to the, the drought and the lake. Um, and it shows the staircases and sidewalks of the grotto clearly visible um, in the Abbey Gardens over to the left. And that brings us to our starting um, ending point. And um, I don't know if I've satisfied your curiosity or aroused it, or um, if you've got questions to ask me of things that you're curious about. Yeah. Oh, go, go ahead, Lynn. Um, it was called it was called um, Lake St. Louis or St. Louis Lake St. and St. John's Abbey was St. Louis on the lake in honor of King Ludwig. Um, it's not real clear at what point they changed the name officially to Sagatagan, but um, Alexius Hoffman, because of his research into the Native American presence, and he, he wrote a natural, natural history of St. John's, he started, I think he's the one who started to advocate for the Native American name for it, Sagatagan. There's still a bunch of discrepancies as to where the name Sagatagan came from. Um, what, um, Father um, Abbott, Peter Engels, I think it's Peter, maybe it's Alexius, um, has a diary where he says Sagatagan was the name of an Indian chief who was buried on the south side of the lake. That seems to be a pretty credible story to me anyway. And you had one, Michael? Mm. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's made, in some respects, it's made my, my work a lot easier. For example, having all that stuff digitized to find those references in the record and the other publications is just, I mean, it would have been pretty impossible to do before. Now I can find things, although the computer reading the words isn't perfect in the older publications because they can't read the font or something that was hand typed. You know, um, so it only finds the words that the computer was able to read. But the larger question of digital, the digital world that we live in now, yes, it's made things very interesting and complicated. We don't have a yearbook anymore. We use our old yearbooks a lot, Liz and I, to answer questions for students and the old records. Uh, the record's still being published, but the yearbook is no longer and hasn't been since 95. Um, Liz had a question just yesterday from a student whose parents graduated in 86, 87, and she wanted to see them in the yearbook. You know, anybody after 95, it's just not there. And so many other things are put on social media or Instagram and other things that don't find their way to the archives. And so many of those things are, in a way, a record of what was happening on campus. So yes, I save all the bulletin board postings, you know, that I get electronically, I save all the faculty minutes and just about anything that's regularly published that can come out by email, I archive all of that. And it's searchable after a manner of speaking, but you know, it's subject to the next change iteration of technology and, and are they going to be obsolete? Who knows? Um, PDFs are one thing that's considered archivally sound. So things that are put into PDFs are, you know, something that should stay forever, but it's an ongoing challenge. And so many things just don't find their way to the archives anymore that used to, you know, once a year, somebody would clean out their files, files and send them to us or, or when somebody retires or quits, their files would get cleaned out and sent to the archives maybe. Um, now, digital stuff, no, it's easy to push the button and just delete. Yeah, it's scary makes it's going to make life a lot harder for somebody 20 years down the road trying to figure out what happened now or 
or 10 years ago. I mean, some of this stuff I've started saving digitally, but there was a window there between times. Um, my, my early email, you know, that doesn't exist anymore. Any other questions? We're probably out of time here. Oh, you got one? one. The schoolhouse for the parish um, that, that was built in 1925 and torn down in what, 74, 73, um, before the parish celebrated its centennial in 75. Um, and there was another schoolhouse for the district, that public school where the Robert Flieger house is or was, that little parking lot next to the cemetery it used to be the Flieger house where Jane Simon grew up. Um, and that was a schoolhouse before that, or at least that site was the site of a public school. There's a public school there, and there was the one that the decrepit, the decrepit crumbling rocks of which are still findable in that triangle by the freeway exit for St. John's. Some of you might know about that, some of you don't, but there's a was an old schoolhouse out by the freeway, and it's in that triangle between the exit ramp for the freeway and the frontage road and County 159. Here's a crumbling little schoolhouse back in those trees that you can't hardly see now unless you go walking in there to look for it. It's got trees growing in it. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. Uh-huh. That's true, and that's kind of the basis for some of the ghost stories that get told. Um, the, they have, the Abbott had several pet deer over the years, but they did have a pet bear back in the 1800s. And the ghost stories come about because he actually killed a student. The bear killed a student because the student was heckling him and annoying him. Otherwise he was, he, he had always been good with people, but there was a student who was pestering him and he took a swipe and killed the kid. Um, and so there's ghost stories related to that. It's one of several. I gotta do a presentation on just the ghost story sometime. because Students are always asking me that, especially this time of year. Okay, well, you know where to find me or email me or call me if you have questions. I, I just love digging up stuff and maybe I'll know the answer. And if not, it'll become something to hunt for. All right, I think that's everything. Thank you everybody for attending and thank you again, Peggy.